In this presentation, we're going to discuss concrete mechanics. Essentially, what is concrete and how does it behave? Some of the slide materials are taken from materials developed by the Portland Cement Association. By the end of this presentation, you should be able to list the key components in concrete, list the raw materials that make up cement, briefly describe the cement making process, explain how the primary reactants in cement affect its behavior, name the primary types of cement and some of their characteristics and uses, explain how concrete progresses to failure and compression, describe the interfacial transition zone or ITZ, its role in failure and how it can be strengthened, discuss the different factors that affect the compressive strength of concrete, explain the three methods for determining concrete tensile strength, discuss how concrete behavior is affected by biaxial and triaxial loading, create a stress strain curve for concrete using one of the given expressions, use the stress strain curve for concrete to relate stress to strain and vice versa, and finally use compatibility to relate strain and deformation to force in axial loaded reinforced concrete members. Cement and concrete aren't the same thing. Cement is just one of the components, specifically the binding agent in concrete. The analogy shown here is, a, is good for explaining the, this difference. Flour is to cake as cement is to concrete. Flour is just one of the ingredients making up the cake batter, just like cement is just one of the ingredients that makes up the concrete mix. Concrete is specifically made up primarily of aggregates and a binding agent. There are typically two types of aggregate used, coarse aggregate, typically crushed limestone or river gravel, and fine aggregates, typically sand or finely ground limestone. The binding agent is typically made up of cement, water, and any chemical admixtures, generally used to modify the workability of the concrete mix. You can remember the raw materials needed to make cement with the acronym LISA, lime, iron, silica, and alumina. Gypsum is also added to control the set time. Lime is typically from crushed limestone or shale and makes up the largest proportion of the mix, about 65% of the materials. Iron is typically from mill scale, iron ore, clay, or slag and makes up only a small portion of the mix, about 3%. Silica is typically from clay, shale, sand, or fly ash, and makes up about 21% of the mix. Alumina is typically from clay, shale, fly ash, or bauxite, and makes up about 6% of the mix. The raw materials, typically limestone, iron, ore, and clay, are finely ground and mixed together. The dry ground mixture is taken through a large cylindrical rotating oven called a kiln and heated to between 1400 to 1500 degrees Celsius or about 2500 to 2700 degrees Fahrenheit. The heat from the kiln causes the material to combine into softball size rocks called clinker. This clinker is then ground to make cement. The fineness of the grind affects the speed of the cement hydration reaction. So type three high early strength cement would have a finer grind than other types of cement. When talking about cement, cement hydration, and concrete material properties, there's a different set of symbols to represent some of the common compounds found in hydrated cement paste and concrete. Here are some of the symbols that we will use in the following slides to represent some of these compounds. Lime, silica, water, alumina, ferric oxide, sulfur trioxide, and carbonate. These are the primary reactants in cement. Tricalcium silicate or C3S, dicalcium silicate C2S, tricalcium aluminate C3A, tetracalcium aluminoferrite, C4AF, gypsum, CSH3, and water, just H. 
C3S and C2S are the primary reactants that give us strength in our uh, hydrated cement paste. Here is an image of cement using a scanning electron microscope. You can see that C3S, C2S, and C3A make up the largest portion of the cement. The different reactants will react with the water to develop strength in the hydrated cement paste over time. C3A and C3S give a high early strength. C2S gains its strength more slowly, but leads to a better concrete matrix. There are several different types of cement that are typically used in construction. Type 1 is ordinary port Portland cement and is the primary type used in construction. Type 3 is a high early strength cement, which has an increased fineness compared to the type 1 cement. It is generally used at precast plants to allow the plant to turn over their forms daily. Types 2 and 4 are low heat of hydration cements that can be used for mass concrete pours. Types 2 and 5 are sulfate resisting cements that can help with some forms of sulfate attack. The type of cement will impact the development of strength. Type 3 will develop strength more quickly but may not develop as much strength as other types of cement. On this slide, the heat developed versus time is plotted for cement with three different finenesses. Finer cement will react quicker and more completely, which will cause a higher heat of hydration. This will lead to cements gaining strength more quickly, but can cause concrete mixtures to get too hot in mass concrete pores or in hot climates. Different types of cement will also have different compositions. The composition of the five main types of cement are shown here. Some things to highlight. Type 4 cement, which is a low heat of hydration cement, has a smaller C3S content, which is faster to react, and larger C2S content, which is slower to react. Having more of the slower reacting component keeps the heat of hydration lower. Type 2 and 5 cements, which are sulfate resisting cements, have lower C3A contents. C3A is one of the reactants in external sulfate attack, so limiting C3A content reduces susceptibility to external sulfate attack. Type 3 cement, or high early strength cement, has a much higher fineness than the other types of cement, which means the cement will react faster, leading to a higher heat of hydration and higher early strength development. Type 1 cement is used in the most applications. Some applications for type 1 cement include highway pavements, floors, cast-in-place bridges, and cast-in-place buildings. Generally, type 1 cement is used for all cast-in-place and conventional construction. Type 2 and type 5 cement is generally used in members in contact with the ground susceptible to external sulfate attack. This includes pipes, slabs on grade, and posts. Note that external sulfate attack is only an issue when high levels of water-soluble sulfates, primarily sodium sulfates or magnesium sulfate, are present in, in the soil or groundwater. Type 3 cement is a high early strength cement and is typically used for precast concrete or accelerated construction applications. Type 3 cement also has a high heat of hydration, so it can also be used in cold weather climates. Type 4 cement has a low heat of hydration and is used for members and structures with mass concrete pores including large bridge piers and dams. Too high a heat of hydration can lead to durability issues in the, con in the concrete, such as delayed etringite formation, or DEF. The rate of heat evolution, degree of hydration, and concrete state 
are shown on this slide, all versus time. Hydration of Portland cement begins when the water first comes in contact with the cement. At this point, the water begins reacting with all the reactants in the cement around the outside edge of the cement grain. The products of cement hydration are larger than the reactants, so a hydrated cement grain has a larger volume than dry cement. The cement or concrete remains workable until the hydration products from adjacent cement grains touch. This point, when they first touch, is called initial set. Final set occurs an hour or so later when the hydration products connect between cement grains. The heat of hydration and strength both increase rapidly following initial set. After about 8 to 16 hours, the heat of hydration starts to drop. Strength will continue to develop over the life of the cement. There are two primary reactions that occur during the hydration of Portland cement. C3S and C2S both react with water to form CSH, CH, and heat. CSH is calcium silicate hydrate and is a very strong and dense hydration product. CH, or calcium hydroxide, is weak and soluble. Note that C3S produces three times as much CH as C2S. So although C3S causes a quicker initial strength gain, it leads to more CH, which weakens the concrete matrix. Here are images from a microscope of CSH. CSH is the primary hydration product, making up 50 to 60% of volume solids, and is very strong and dense. It is non-crystalline, amorphous, and has high van der Waals forces. Basically, CSH gives our cement and our concrete strength. Calcium hydroxide makes up between 20 and 25% of volume solids and is weak and soluble. CH is crystalline and has low van der Waals forces. So CH weakens our concrete matrix. Two additional reactions that occur are shown here. C3A reacts with gypsum and water to form etringite and heat. Etringite is crystalline, as shown, with needle-like crystal structure. If etringite forms initially, there's room for it to grow, and also some of it will react with more C3A in water to form monosulfate. However, a high early heat will prevent this reaction from occurring until much later. In this scenario, there's no room for the etringite to form, so the formation of etringite causes cracking. This durability issue is called delayed etringite formation, or DEF. Note that the presence of etringite in the concrete matrix does not mean there is DEF, as etringite is always a product of hydration. DEF is only a concern if the etringite forms after final set of the concrete. Here is a plot of the hydration products over time. It can be seen that the initial hydration products are calcium hydroxide, or CH, and etringite. These are the two products that lead to initial set. After about two hours, CSH begins to be produced. This gives the cement paste its strength. After a few days, the etringite reacts with water and any remaining C3A to form monosulfate. The porosity is also shown on this plot as the dashed light blue line. As the cement hydrates and, hydra and hydration products form, the porosity decreases. The five main stages of cement hydration are highlighted on this slide. There is an initial rapid heat development as the C3A and sulfates interact. This initial heat is followed by a dormant period prior to initial set. This period allows the concrete to be placed and is controlled by admixtures and gypsum. Next is the acceleration stage, when there is hydration of primarily C3S. This stage will determine the rate of hardening and final set. The deceleration stage will determine the rate of early strength gain and involves the hydration of remaining C3S, C3A, and some C2S. The final stage is the steady stage, and it involves the hydration of C2S and it determines the later strength of the concrete. We will now look at concrete's compressive behavior. 
The mechanism for failure of concrete and compression involves four main steps. First, we have the formation of microcracks around the aggregate. Next, we have the expansion of these microcracks from around the aggregate. These microcracks expand from around the aggregate into the mortar, causing mortar cracks. And then finally, these mortar cracks connect, which causes failure. The area around the aggregate is called the interfacial transition zone, or ITZ, and is highlighted in this slide. The ITZ is typically the weak point in the concrete matrix. While both CSH and CH form in the bulk hydrated cement paste, CH alone tends to form and orient around the aggregate in the ITZ. This concentration of CH around the aggregate causes a weak point that leads to microcracking and increased permeability. The stress versus strain plot for concrete and compression is shown here with the stages of failure highlighted. The concrete remains linear elastic as the micro cracks expand. The concrete begins to go inelastic when concrete extends into the mortar and gets more inelastic until failure as the mortar cracks connect. Note that expansion and connection of mortar cracks will have a large effect on the transverse and volumetric strains. Next, we'll step through the primary factors affecting the compressive strength of concrete. The factor that has the largest impact on the compressive strength is the water to cement ratio. Increasing the amount of water, which will increase the water to cement ratio, will increase porosity and decrease the strength. High water to cement ratios lead to low concrete strength. Low water to cement ratios lead to higher concrete strengths. The use of supplementary cementitious materials, or SCMs, will also impact the strength of concrete. SCMs are used to modify the properties of concrete or to decrease the cost. The primary SCMs are shown here and include fly ash, both class C and class F, silica fume, slag cement, metakaolin, and calcin calcinated shale. SCMs can either be more pozzolanic or hydraulic. Hydraulic SCMs perform similar to cement. Hydraulic SCMs have higher concentrations of C3S and C2S and gain strength similar to Portland cement. Hydraulic SCMs can be used to replace Portland cement to decrease heat of hydration, improve durability, or decrease costs. Pozzolanic SCMs have a higher pozzolan content. The silica from these SCMs reacts with CH and water to form CSH, which improves the strength and durability of the concrete. The composition of SCMs can also be represented in the triangle shown here, with the three corners being silica, lime, and alumina. SCMs that are closer to the C corner will be more hydraulic. SCMs that are closer to the silica corner will be more pozzolanic. Pozzolanic SCMs will react with CH to form CSH, which will strengthen the interfacial transition zone, or ITZ. This can increase the strength and durability of the concrete. Fly ash is a byproduct of burning coal which is typically done for generating electricity. The inorganic minerals in the coal melt during combustion and form droplets. The cooling of these droplets forms spherical fly ash particles. The spherical shape of the fly ash and the fact it has a similar particle size to Portland cement result in fly ash typically improving the workability of concrete, having a ball bearing effect. The composition of fly ash is dependent on the composition of the coal. Most of the coal being burned today produces class C fly ash, which is less favorable than class F fly ash. A decrease in coal generated power and class C producing coal sources are making fly ash less popular today. Slag is produced in blast furnaces as an industrial byproduct from the production of iron used to make steel. Iron ore is combined with fluxing stone and fuel and heated. 
Heat causes the material to separate out into burden, slag, and pig iron. The pig iron is used for making steel. The slag is used in concrete. The way the slag is processed will affect how it can be used. The liquid slag is cooled rapidly using water to ensure it forms the amorphous phase necessary for hydraulic benefits. Crystalline slag exhibits little or no cementitious behavior. This process separates the slag. Expanded slag can be used as lightweight aggregate. Granulated slag is ground and used as a hydraulic SEM. Silica fume is produced in an electric arc furnace as an industrial byproduct of the production of silicon metals and ferrosilicon alloys. Its production requires a very high temperature reaction and produces a very fine pozzolanic SCM. These are views from a microscope of the three main types of SCMs, fly ash, slag cement, and silica fume. Fly ash is primarily solid spheres with some hollow spheres containing other spheres. Typical dosages of fly ash are 15 to 25% for class F and 15 to 40% for class C. Class F fly ash is more pozzolanic and class C is more hydraulic. Slag cement is glassy granulated pellets that are ground down to the desired size. Typical dosages of slag are 30 to 70% by mass of cementitious materials, generally to decrease the heat of hydration. Silica fume is an amorphous silica with high SO2 content. Silica fume has an extremely small particle size and a large surface area. This results in a dramatically increased water demand. The typical dosage is 5 to 10% by mass of cementitious material for silica fume. The next slides show how these three SCMs impact the fresh concrete properties and the hardened concrete properties. Fly ash will generally decrease the water demand slightly. It'll improve the workability due to the ball bearing effect of the spherical fly ash particles, and it'll decrease the bleeding and segregation. The impact of slag cement on the water demand, workability and bleeding and segregation is dependent on its fineness. Silica fume will dramatically increase the water demand. It'll decrease the workability and it will decrease the bleeding and segregation. Fly ash and silica fume will both decrease the air content, which means that more air entraining agent should be used with fly ash and silica fume. Fly ash and slag cement will both decrease the heat of hydration. The pozzolanic reactions resulting from the use of fly ash occur after the hydraulic reactions of the Portland cement. Typically enough Portland cement is, is replaced by fly ash to decrease this initial heat of hydration. Slag has a higher C2S content than Portland cement. Since C2S is slower to react, the initial heat of hydration is lower. Fly ash and slag will both increase the setting time of concrete, while silica fume will slightly accelerate the rate of hydration and the setting time. All three SCMs will increase the plastic shrinkage cracking and increase the required curing times, as water is required for longer periods to fuel pozzolanic and later hydraulic reactions. If you use SCMs, you need to make sure that, that you cure your concrete properly. Now we're going to look at the hardened concrete properties. Fly ash and slag will both decrease early age strength as they have later developing pozzolanic and C2S driven hydraulic reactions. However, they can increase long term strength if properly cured. Silica fume, on the other hand, will increase all compressive strengths. Flash, slag cement, and silica fume will all decrease the freeze thaw and de icer scaling resistance. This is a result of them decreasing the amount of entrained air. More air entraining agents should be used with SCMs to mitigate this effect. The main benefit of SCMs is in terms of long term durability. 
Flash, slag cement, and silica fume will all decrease the permeability. A decreased permeability means that the concrete will be more resistant to corrosion, as it will take longer for chlorides to reach the level of the steel. Class F fly ash, slag cement in large dosages, and silica fume can also be used to prevent alkali silica reaction, or ASR expansion, which can occur otherwise when reactive aggregates are used. Class C fly ash, slag cement, and silica fume can all also be used to improve the resistance of the concrete to external and internal sulfate attack. Again, SCMs are primarily used to improve the durability of concrete. Fly ash and slag will have little to no effect on color, while silica fume may darken the concrete. Finally, fly ash and slag will generally have no effect on drying shrinkage and creep while silica fume can slightly decrease drying shrinkage and creep. Now we're going to go back to our other factors affecting the compressive strength of concrete. Chemical admixtures can be used to modify the fresh concrete properties. They can be used to retard or accelerate setting times, decrease water content, increase workability, reduce segregation, reduce the rate of slump loss, improve pumpability, placeability, or finishability, or modify the rate and or capacity for bleeding. Chemical admixtures can also be used to modify the hardened properties. They can be used to improve resistance to cycle, cyclic freezing and thawing, inhibit corrosion of embedded metals, inhibit the expansion due to alkali silica reaction, reduce long-term drying shrinkage, reduce permeability, improve impact and abrasion resistance, or produce colored concrete. There are several different classifications for chemical admixtures. Most of the types here have to do with reducing the amount of water needed um, to get a certain amount of workability. So types A, C, D, E, F, and G are all designed to reduce the amount of water needed to get a uh, target workability. Uh, type B and C have to do with the set time. So type B retards the set time or, or gives you more working time, and type C accelerates the set time or uh, makes the concrete set faster. The focus in this class will be on the water reducing admixtures as these can be used to impact the strength of our concrete. These can be used to reduce the amount of water needed to get a certain amount of workability. And we know that decreasing water increases our strength. Here's a history of water reducing admixtures. The major advance that affected modern concrete was the creation of high range water reducing admixtures. Early water reducing admixtures caused sticky mixes and also acted as retarding agents, so they could not be used as much to modify the water to cement ratio. High range water reducing admixtures allowed engineers to achieve lower water to cement ratios, which resulted in higher concrete compressive strengths. Water reducing admixtures reduce the amount of water required to produce a certain slump. These admixtures create an even dispersion of cement particles in the concrete, which improves workability. High range water reducing admixtures allow for high strength concrete and self consolidating concrete, SCC. SCC is a type of concrete with extremely high flowability. SCC can be placed without any vibrators and can be used to produce nice architectural finishes. The next factor that can have an impact on the strength is the type and quantity of the aggregate. Aggregates make up over 70% of the concrete mixture, so their properties have a large impact on the concrete properties. Note that there's a lot of variability in aggregate properties, so it's very difficult to make generalizations on how aggregate type and quantity will impact strength. Shown here are the two main types of aggregate, coarse and fine aggregate, and also the two main types of coarse aggregate, gravel and crushed stone. 
The plot here shows the compressive strength versus aggregate size for concrete with three different water to cement ratios. Note that the concrete with a water to cement ratio of 0.4 has the highest strength of the three mixes. Generally for higher strength concrete, larger aggregate sizes will decrease the overall strength. This is because the failure crack will generally go through the aggregate in high strength concrete and larger aggregate sizes can result in failure planes with a larger proportion of aggregate. The curing type and duration will have an impact on the early age strength, but will generally have a minimal impact on the ultimate strength. This plot shows the relative strength versus time for concrete cured using different methods with differing amounts of time. Proper curing will improve early age strength, and if water is reintroduced to the concrete at any time during its life, a more rapid strength gain will gener generally occur. The long-term strength will usually converge at about the same value though. Note that this plot does not consider the use of SCMs. Initial curing conditions are much more critical for concrete containing SCMs. The compressive strength of concrete will develop over time. A common expression used to estimate the compressive strength development over time is shown on this slide. The concrete strength F prime C at any time T is equal to F prime C at 28 days times T time over A plus B times T. A and B are dependent on mixture and curing conditions, but can be solved for if, if you know the test results at different times. For a type one cement moist cured for three days, you can assume A equal to four and B equal to 0.85. Similar to steel, the rate of loading will impact the strength of concrete. The dynamic impact factors for compressive and tensile concrete strengths are shown in these two plots for differing strain rates. Concrete will have a higher observed strength under higher strain rates. Note that this highlights the importance of using the proper loading rate when running material tests on concrete. Applying the load too quickly on, concrete, on a concrete cylinder can make your concrete seem stronger than it actually is. Here are the stress strain curves for concrete loaded at four different strain rates. Faster loading resulted in a higher compressive strength a lower strain at ultimate strength, a steeper descending branch after the ultimate strength was reached, and less ductility. Again, the most important point is that concrete will have a higher compressive and tensile strength if loaded faster. The size of concrete members will also impact the strength. The two plots shown here show the relative strength plotted versus the size of an unreinforced concrete specimen. Larger members will generally be weaker than smaller members because larger members are more likely to have poor compaction or some other type of weak zone. Note that this size effect can be mitigated with the proper use of reinforcement. We next turn to the behavior of concrete in tension. Concrete's very weak in tension. Its tensile strength is typically 8 to 15% of its compressive strength. This is because the tensile strength is dependent on the van der Waal force between the CSH and CH molecule solids. These bonds are, are not chemical bonds, like ionic or covalent bonds, so they are relatively weak. There are several different ways that we will use to test the tensile strength of concrete. The modulus of rupture test, shown here, is either a three or four point bending test as specified by ASTM C293 or ASTM C78. In these tests, a load is applied until cracking of the beam occurs. Because these specimens are unreinforced, cracking leads to immediate failure of the beam. The applied load can be used with simple mechanics relationships to determine the stress in the bottom fiber of the concrete when the beam cracked and failed. This bottom fiber stress is taken as the tensile strength of the concrete. This test will result in a tensile strength equal to about seven and a half square roots of F prime C. 
It's generally used for the service level stress checks for flexure, mem flexure members. Another way to measure the tensile strength of concrete is using split cylinder tests, which are explained in detail in ASTM C496. This test involves a standard 4 inch by 8 inch or 6 inch by 12 inch cylinder placed on its side. A load is applied along the length of the cylinder, which causes splitting stresses to develop in the center of the cylinder, as shown. Load is applied until the splitting crack causes the cylinder to break into two pieces. The load required to cause failure can be used to find the stress along the failure plane. This stress is taken as the tensile strength of the concrete. This test will result in a tensile strength equal to about six times the square root of F prime C and is used in tensile strength applications. The last way that tensile strength can be measured is using a direct tensile test. This test involves applying a tensile load to the concrete until the specimen fails in tension. The tensile strength can then be found by taking the failure load divided by the area of the failure plane. This is a difficult test to run for conventional concrete because it is such a low tensile strength. The low tensile strengths do not allow for any load redistribution. So if the load is applied even the slightest bit off center, the tensile failure will start at one side and will result in a lower tensile strength than the concrete actually has. This type of test is typically used for two applications. First, it's used, it can be used to find the tensile strength of ultra high performance concrete or UHPC. UHPC has a very high tensile strength, so there is a larger tolerance with load app application. This test is normally run on a dog bone shaped specimen like the one shown on this slide with the failure plane occurring at the narrow point in the specimen. This type of test is also used to determine the bond strength between two materials or at a cold joint. Details for this test can be found in ASTM C1583. This test pulls on a steel piece embedded in concrete, as shown in the figure on the bottom of the slide, and tests the tensile strength of the interface plane. If the bond strength of the interface plane is greater than the tensile strength of the substrate, then the failure plane will be located in the substrate. Shown here are the experimental results for many different split cylinder tests. The splitting tensile strength is plotted versus the compression strength for each test. There's a large amount of scatter in the data because the tensile strength of concrete has a lot of variability. The only specified tensile strength in the 318 building code is the modulus of rupture strength, which is taken as 7.5 times lambda times the square root of F prime C, where lambda accounts for the effects of lightweight concrete. The commentary also mentions another relationship for the splitting tensile strength, which is 6.5 uh, times lambda times the square root of F prime C. Both of these expressions more or less split the uh, scatter of data in half. Concrete will be affected by multi-axial loading. In other words, transverse stresses will impact the strength of concrete. Shown here is the failure envelope for a concrete specimen loaded along two axes with stress sigma one and sigma two. When we have no transverse stress, or when sigma two equals zero, sigma one equals F prime C. When we add transverse compress compression stresses, or sigma two is in compression, we will have a strength sigma one greater than F prime C. When we add any transverse tension, in other words, sigma two is a tensile stress, we decrease the, compress the compressive strength of sigma one. The benefits gained by adding transverse compression are called confinement. The loss of strength caused by transverse tension will impact our shear strength. Richart et al. proposed an equation to account for the benefits of transverse compressive st stresses based on experimental testing. They found the compressive strength will increase by 4.1 times the active confining stress applied. You can see in their test results that they found that adding 4,090 PSI of confining stress increases the compression strength from around 3,800 PSI to almost 20,000 PSI. Confinement will greatly improve the overall behavior of the concrete. 
We will look at confinement more in depth later in our class. We will next look at the shape of the stress strain curve for concrete. The stress strain curve for concrete is different for different concrete strengths and mixtures. There are five key parameters that capture the shape of the curve. These include the initial slope or modulus of elasticity of our concrete, our curve shape, the strain at maximum stress, the descending branch, and the maximum strain or ultimate strain of the concrete. The first parameter is the initial slope of the curve. The slope or stiffness of the concrete can be either taken as the secant modulus EC or the tangent modulus ET. The tangent modulus is the slope of the stress strain curve at the origin. This will be the stiffest the concrete will be or the steepest slope of the stress strain curve. The secant modulus EC is the slope of the stress strain curve between the origin and the point on the curve at 0.45 f prime c. The secant modulus does a better job of representing the quote-unquote linear range for concrete. So the secant modulus is used in ACI. ACI has two different expressions to calculate the modulus of elasticity, shown here. One expression allowing you to factor in the concrete weight, and one assuming normal weight concrete. The next parameter is the curve shape. The ascending branch of the stress strain curve from the origin to the ultimate strength will generally have a parabolic shape, a general parabolic expression that can be used to relate concrete stress, Fc, to concrete strain, epsilon c, is shown here. The next parameter is the strain at the maximum concrete stress. This value is typically epsilon naught, but is sometimes written as epsilon prime c. The strain at ultimate strength will usually be around 0.002. There are, are equations to calculate this value in some of the proposed stress-strain stress relationships for concrete that we'll look at. The descending branch of the stress strain curve defines the behavior of the concrete after it has reached its ultimate strength. The descending branch can be modeled as parabolic, but it is often modeled as linear. The slope of the descending branch is dependent on the concrete strength. Higher strength concretes will have steeper descending branches, as higher strength concretes typically have more brittle and sudden failures. The next parameter is the maximum strain that the concrete can hold before failure, or ultimate strain. This variable is either epsilon ultimate or epsilon cu. The maximum strain can vary between 0.0025 and 0.006 for flexure test without any confinement effects. ACI assumes this strain to be 0.003. Note that the maximum strain can be significantly higher than this when confinement effects are taken into account. There are many different stress-strain relationships that have been proposed by researchers in the past. I will introduce a few of them in the next few slides. The first shown here is the modified Hognestad relationship. This relationship models a parabolic ascending branch and a linear descending branch for the concrete. This relationship is good for concrete with ultimate strength less than 6 KSI. Note that Hognestad originally proposed that a value of F prime prime C equal to 0.85 F prime C be used in place of F prime C in all of these equations. His research was aimed at modeling the behavior of reinforced concrete columns, and this 15% reduction took into account the effect of size and shape of the column, as well as the casting position. For design, to account for the difference between the in-place strength and the cylinder strength, you can use 0.9 F 0.9 times F prime C in these equations. Another stress strain relationship was used by Todeschini et al. looking at the behavior of reinforced concrete columns with high strength steel. This relationship has one expression relating the concrete stress to concrete strain for both the ascending and descending branches. This relationship represents the stress strain curve for 
concrete well with ultimate strengths less than 6 KSI. Note that when using all of these stress strain relationships for concrete, you will need to set the concrete stress equal to zero after the maximum strain has been reached. Another stress strain relationship developed by Thornfeld et al. based on work done by Popovics is shown here. This set of equations has been shown to effectively model the stress strain behavior of concrete with ultimate compressive strengths up to 18 KSI. More details on this relationship can also be found in Collins and Mitchell's textbook, Pre-Stressed Concrete Structures. The tension behavior of concrete up until the tensile strength can either be represented as a straight line with slope EC or a parabola. In this class, we will assume that strain will vary linearly with tensile stress up until the tensile capacity of the concrete. The slope of this ascending branch will be EC, the secant modulus found before. You can assume that the descending branch either drops in stress immediately after reaching the ultimate tensile strength with no additional increase in strain, or you can assume the descending branch has a slope of EC over five to EC over 10. This slide shows two plots describing the fatigue strength of concrete. The top plot shows fatigue testing on a number of different samples with a total number of cycles required to cause failure at different stress levels. Lower levels of cycle stress results in more cycles required to cause failure. Carson and Yursa recommend keeping the cycled stress on concrete under 0.63 F'C. Note that the only stress limit that takes into account fatigue and ACI is for class U and T pre-stress members, where the concrete compressive stress under pre-stress and total load must be under 0.6 F'C. The lower plot shows the hysteresis loops that occur under de deformation controlled cyclic loading. When concrete is loaded into the inelastic zone or above around 0.7 F'C and unloaded, there will be an inelastic deformation. Additional cyclic loads will cause additional inelastic deformations. The peaks of the hysteresis loops will roughly follow the static stress strain response of the concrete. We will now quickly review how concrete and steel relate to one another through compatibility using an example problem. In this example problem, we want to find the axial load versus strain plot for the column section shown below. And this column is subjected to axial loads only, and we'll assume that uh, we don't need to worry about buckling. So we have a 12 inch by 12 inch column with four number 10 bars, an F prime C or concrete strength of 4 KSI, a yield strength of our steel of 60 KSI. We can find our area of our steel just by taking four times the area of each number 10 bar or 1.27 square inches, which will give us an area of steel equal to 5.08 square inches. The area of our concrete is our gross area, 12 inches squared, minus the area of our steel. The modulus of elasticity will assume normal weight concrete and use our ACI expression, remembering that our concrete strength needs to be in PSI. So our modulus will be 57,000 times the square root of 4,000 PSI divided by 1,000 pounds per kip to give us 3,600 KSI stiffness. The general procedure for this type of problem is shown here. We'll first assume a strain that both materials want, will undergo. So the whole column will strain a certain amount. Then using this strain and the stress strain curves for each material, we'll find the corresponding stresses in the steel and the concrete. We will then use the respective cross section areas for our steel and our concrete to calculate the force in each material. And then we can add these forces together to get our total force in the column. And we'll repeat this for other strains. We will use an elastic plastic relationship for our steel and the parabolic stress strain relationship proposed by Todeschini et al. for our concrete. We can use Hooke's law 
and the known yield strength and stiffness of the steel to find the yield strain of the steel, which will be 0 0.00207 in the case for our grade 60 reinforcement. We need to find our strain at ultimate concrete strength, or epsilon naught, using our concrete strength and our modulus, which we'll find to be 0 0.0019. We will assume that the maximum strain our concrete can hold is 0 0.003 based on the ACI assumption. We can then go through our general procedure for several points. I am going to use a strain of 0 0.001 as an example. Note that this is an arbitrary strain. When developing a full curve, you should use a spreadsheet software to find multiple points. Using our selected strain of 0 0.001, we can plug into our stress strain equation for concrete and linear elastic stress strain equation for steel to determine the stress in the concrete and the steel. In this example, at point 001 strain, we have 3.3 KSI stress in the concrete and 29 KSI stress in the reinforcement. We can then take our concrete and steel stresses times the concrete and steel areas to determine the forces in the concrete and the steel. We then can sum the concrete and steel forces to find the total force. At 0 0.001 strain, we have 458 kips in the concrete, 147.3 kips in the steel, and a total of 605.3 kips in the column. We should then repeat this procedure for other strain values to complete our curve. This table summarizes the results for several different strain points, including the strain at ultimate concrete strength, yield strain, strain just before and just after the crushing of concrete, and the strain at the start of the strain hardening region. The total column load, or P total, was found for each of these compressive strains. We will now look at the column response under tensile strains. We first need to find the tensile strength of the concrete and the strain when the concrete fails in tension. We'll use 7.5 times the square root of F prime C to find our tensile strength, which, in, which here is 0.474 KSI. Then we'll divide this by our modulus of elasticity to find the strain when the concrete fails in tension, which will be 1.32 times 10 to the negative fourth strain. The same procedure outlined in the compression strain calculations can be used for the tensile strains. The first strain used in this is the strain when the concrete fails in tension, which is 0 0.000132. The load in the column found at this point is the tensile load required to cause cracking in the column. We will assume that the concrete no longer contributes any capacity after it, creak, after it cracks. Um, in other words, our FC and our PC will be equal to zero. This means that all of the force in the column will transfer from the concrete and steel together to just the steel. This will cause the steel to experience additional deformation or strain as it takes the force from the column. We can determine the strain in the steel immediately after cracking by taking the cracking load divided by the steel area to give the stress in the steel and then divide by the modulus of elasticity for the steel to give us the strain. In this case, the column will increase in strain to 0 0.00058 as the stress is transferred into the steel. Two additional points were found in tension, the yield strain and the strain at the end of the yield plateau. This plot shows the column force versus strain response for the reinforced concrete column. Additional points could be found in the ascending compression force branch as the concrete stress strain response is parabolic in this region. Make sure to label your axes, including units, and specify tension and compression. This is the solution to this example problem. If we assume that both of our materials are linear elastic, we can simplify the procedure for relating strains to force. We can combine our equilibrium, compatibility, and constitutive relationships to directly relate stress in the concrete to force in the column. 
Then using Hooke's law, we can relate our strain to our force. Within this expression relating strain to column force, we have what is called the transformed area. The transformed area is the total concrete area that represents the behavior of the concrete and steel combined. We are transforming the steel into an equivalent concrete area using the modular ratio N, which is just the ratio of the steel modulus of elasticity to the concrete modulus of elasticity. Note that we can move one of our steel areas over to our concrete area to give us the gross area, AG, plus N minus one times AS equal to our transformed area. We will normally do this as it's usually easier to work with the gross section properties than it is in the net section properties. Using the transformed area simplifies our equation even more. Remember again that this approach is assuming linear elastic material properties. We should always check our assumptions at the end of a problem or design. We can use the transform section approach to find an equation relating strain to force for our example. We first find the transformed area, which in this case is 179.6 square inches. Then we use our concrete modulus to find the equation relating strain to force. This equation can be plotted alongside the previous plot to compare how it performs. The results from the transform section approach are plotted next to the detailed analysis here. It can be seen that the transform section approach reasonably estimates the behavior between the strain causing cracking in the concrete and around 70% of F prime C. This is generally the acceptable range for using the transform section approach. Here's a list of references for further study on this topic.